Hey everyone, welcome to a new episode of Hashtag Ask Firebase, the show where we gather your questions from YouTube, Twitter, Stack Overflow, wherever, and we answer them here. My name is David East, and uh, fun fact about me, I was born in a country that no longer exists. And I'm Sumit Chandel, and I love eating grilled cheese sandwiches. Today's episode is Firestore themed. We gathered a bunch of questions that covers integrating Firestore with a SQL database, using multiple Firestore DBs in a single app, why a Firestore query can be slow, and why the Firestore SDK is designed a certain way. Let's get started. Charles asks, I have a SQL Server. I want to develop a Flutter app with Firestore. Is there a way to implement these together? Great question, Charles. First off, uh, nice choice with Flutter. Secondly, yes, you can totally use Firestore to interact with a SQL database. At Firebase, we design each one of our products for standalone usage and to easily integrate with other technologies. In your case, you need to follow an architecture that looks something like this. One. You find where the data is updated on your SQL Server. This is something like a pizza order and its status. Two, when the data is updated, use the Firebase admin SDK to update it to Firestore. And the admin SDK is written in many languages, so there's likely something that fits your server's needs. Three, create a real-time listener on your client app, your Flutter app in this case, and Firestore does what it does best here. It updates all the listening clients whenever your SQL Server sends an update to the admin SDK. Then lastly, if you need to send data back to the server, you can send data either through a cloud function that talks to your SQL Server, or you can create a real-time listener on your server that processes updates from Firestore. So yes, Firestore works really well with SQL databases, and you don't need to put all of your data in Firestore just to use it in your app. Great question, Charles. Patty cake, patty cake, baker's next question. question. This next question comes from Payush on Twitter. And Payush asks, can I use multiple Firestore databases in a single app? Well, Payush, thank you for asking. And yes, you totally can use multiple databases in one app. It's just a simple configuration when you are initializing an app. Let's take a look at the initialize app function in the JS SDK. And keep in mind, it's similar on other platforms. When you call initialize app, you pass in a config. Underneath the hood, Firebase adds the app in that config to an app array. Now let's say you call it twice. This will create an error. That's because the first initialize app creates what is called a default app. When the second initialize app function is called, it tries to create another default app, but it throws an error because the default app already exists. So what do we do? We provide a name for at least the second app. Now you won't get an error because the second app has its own unique name. But how do you access the second app? Well, initialize app actually returns the app it initializes. You can also tap into the app's array. So Payush, when you're using multiple apps, make sure you're providing a unique name when calling initialize app. Great question, Payush. Next question. This next question comes from, well, a lot of people. And you all asked, why is my Firestore query slow? Sometimes you're developing or troubleshooting a query in production, and you're wondering, why is this slow? And I could come up with a nice list of reasons, but Todd Kerpelman already has. In the Firebase Medium publication, Todd published an article called, Why is my Firestore Query Slow? Oh, and uh, BTW, if you haven't subscribed to that publication, you're missing out on all kinds of awesome content like this. So subscribe, link in the description. So Todd stated five reasons why your query might be slow. Reason number one, it's the data. And that's simple. You're just downloading a bunch of data. If your collection has 10,000 documents, you probably don't need to download all of them. The solution would be to limit the amount that comes back. So do a query and limit you know, the, the amount to 100, 200, whatever. Reason number two, your offline cache is too big. Cloud Firestore does some amazing offline caching, but this local cache does not apply the same indexes that the server does. 
This means when you query documents in your offline cache, Cloud Firestore needs to unpack every document stored locally for the collection being queried and compare it against your query. So the solution here is to limit how much data is being stored in the offline cache. And this can be done by limiting your queries, just like you did previously, uh, and by setting a hard cap on how large your offline cache can be. Reason number three, composite indexing. So you might be running a query that looks like this. There's probably very little overlap between these two conditions. However, without a composite index, Firestore would have to do a lot of searching to get this result set. So instead, create a composite index so Firestore can do a quick lookup. Reason number four, you're used to the real-time database. The real-time database generally has lower latency if you're in North America. And for most apps, though, you're not really going to notice the difference. But if you're an app that needs to squeeze every second of latency, you're probably better off using the real-time database in these scenarios. And lastly, reason number five, the laws of physics are keeping you down. So your customers might be too far away from your Firestore database, and the actual latency from going from point A to B is taking too long. So to fix this, you can use real-time listeners, which use a technique called latency compensation. And latency compensation optimistically updates uh, local updates first, so it feels faster. And real-time listeners also read from the offline cache, which only downloads updates after the initial read. You also have the option of selecting your Cloud Firestore location when you first initialize your database instance. So take a moment to consider what location makes the most sense for your app, not just from a cost perspective, but from a performance perspective as well. So that's a nice handful of reasons. To learn even more, check out Todd's article on the Firebase Medium publication and make sure to subscribe. Oh, hey, Sumit, you want to grab a coffee or something after this? Oh, yeah, about that. Next question. This next question comes from Thies on Twitter. And he asks, why is the data from a Firestore document snapshot returned with a .data function rather than a .data property, since the complete document data was already fetched with the snapshot? Wait, he uh, answered his own question. Got it. The data function takes snapshot options where you can set how you want to retrieve server timestamps that have not yet been set to their final value. I'd never used it and did realize the function had optional arguments. So Thies asked and answered his own question. Are you coming for my job, Thies? Because I'm the one who answers the questions around here. No, 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 no. no. David, please. This does have a good point, though. For those of you who don't know, server timestamps are not always set when you make the initial read because they might still be in the process of being generated. When you set them on the client, it is just a placeholder until the update makes its way to the server where it receives the server's value. The dot data function allows you to control how you receive these timestamps. Also, in case you didn't know, it's a function because it can be an expensive call. The function copies the snapshot into a new object. This is the same for a .val in the real-time database. And in case you want to see how this was implemented, you can see the GitHub pull request in the link below. Great question and answer, Thies. Thank you. I am a question answering robot.